I want to make about uh, this panel and the papers on this panel um, that I think may begin to uh, help generate some foundation for comparing uh, what seems to be a very distinctive case of the United States with the European cases, but I'm not going to do it now. I don't want to steal any of the thunder from the papers. Maybe my mind will change after hearing them. So I'm simply going to introduce our panelists, and they will speak in the order listed, which is the order in which I will uh, introduce them. So uh, Scholt uh, and Yeti is a professor of the Department of Political Science here at the Central European University. So Professor and Yeti, thank you as well for hosting us here. Uh, his research interests are, of course, if you read his paper, party politics, comparative government, comparative democracy, also political psychology, and political tolerance, which is certainly a relevant topic uh, these days. Uh, next we'll hear, and his paper is Border Country Party, um, also very timely. Next we'll hear from Professor Isabella Morris, uh, who used to teach at Stanford and is now a professor of political science at Columbia University. Uh, her paper is on coercion and vote buying in recent East European elections. And um, she has a book that addresses some of these issues that's just been published by Cambridge University Press. It's called uh, From Open Secrets to Secret Ballots. And finally, we're going to hear from doctor, no longer doctoral student, Vanessa Williamson, who uh, recently uh, obtained her PhD in government and social policy at Harvard University with a dissertation looking at American public opinion about taxation and also about what she's talking about here, which is the Tea Party and the title of her presentation, Austerity by Gridlock. And she is now a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. So uh, Professor Agnetti, the floor is yours. I guess, but only for 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, welcome and thank you for the introduction. Um, I decided to start my contribution with a, a quote from someone who has been already mentioned as a major authority, Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, the quote is as follows. We are going to have a country again. Right now, we don't have a country. We don't have a border. And we are going to do something about it. And it, it can be done with proper management, and it can be done with hard. <coughs> now, what I find remarkable about this not very complicated uh, quote is uh, how um, uh, widespread the sentiments are behind these uh, kind of positions. If you think about Europe, this quote could come from Catalonia, where the major issue is secession, or Hungary, where the major issue is the refugee crisis. So there is a general sentiment that uh, the strengthening of external borders will uh, protect national communities. And parallel to that, there is the fear of internal cultural borders. Those which separate the so-called parallel societies of immigrants, uh, that separate immigrants from the indigenous population, and uh, uh, which then trigger appeals uh, for more clear expression of loyalty to the nation state. Now, if one considers the context of globalization, these sentiments are both perplexing and understandable. They are perplexing uh, given the fact that, that uh, it's still the case that multinational economies have a dominant role in the economy, that um, ongoing, there is an ongoing sp uh, spread of a free trade agreement, and that uh, the media, the Anglo-Saxon media, still has a dominant position and still promotes liberal values. Yet, apparently a considerable number of politicians across the world, and some of them actually serious, think that supranational integration can be stopped and even rolled back with, with heart and, and, and proper management. On the other hand, this kind of resistance is completely understandable, given the actual violations of national sovereignty, including uncontrolled uh, immigration, and the fact that a large number of people are immediate, uh, that economic interests are hurt very directly by the globalizing market. So you have this kind of increase of protest across the world, but very rarely you see 
that protest reaching that level of the government. Governments usually can govern without major problems, and the reason for that is that these losers of globalization I'm talking about, they t happen to have typically rather weak economic resources, their cultural capital is typically weak, and their political organizations are also relatively fragile. Now, the situation is somewhat different in those countries, in those cases, where a significant portion of the citizenry feels to be offended in their values by globalization and where you have authoritative institutions like churches, movements, uh, parties, media <coughs> that uh, promote the values of um, this anti-globalization segments of the population and where you have a crystallized ideological frame. Now, th this is typically the case on the peripheries of the developed world in countries where the main uh, the countries which are dominated by uh, Western economic actors, but countries that benefit less from integration than the poor guys. <laughs> Our region, post-communist region, ticks all the boxes. So, so it, we uh, could fit into this uh, category, especially because we have a long history of ethnic nationalist conflicts. So you would expect that, uh, the issue of sovereignty to be um, an obsession of the region. Interestingly, it's not really the case in the sense that in the last uh, two decades, uh, there were many other issues that trumped uh, national sovereignty. When uh, the countries in the region had a chance to join the European Union and transfer part of their national sovereignty to international bodies, they rushed to grasp this opportunity, and those countries that uh, were rejected felt uh, mistreated. So there is not much opposition to integration, or that there hasn't been much in the past. This you could explain by economic reasons, but I think uh, there is also the fact that the cultural liberal model had a very strong appeal in the region. And you could expect that this uh, appeal will provide diffuse support uh, to the institutions or liberal democracy, like uh, constitutionalism, protection of human rights, limited government, and also to the ideology of liberalism, that is uh, um, secularism, respectful treatment of political opponents and minorities, individualism, and so on. But once EU's leverage over these countries was over, partly because they became members, and um, once the crisis hit, you see uh, the countries in the region to show a considerable degree of disloyalty to this uh, uh, mm -hmm. model. If you look at the observatories, the various... Um, uh, I just open my... Uh, yes, uh, uh, um, like Freedom House, uh, World Bank, Casper International, or the Bertelsmann Foundation, you see that they indeed re record a decline in the quality of democracy in most of the countries of the region. Um, since the average is declining, the term backsliding seems to fit uh, an important trend. On the other hand, it's also a little bit misleading term to the extent that the word back is in it and that has the association with some kind of return to the pre-democratic phase. Uh, it's true that the pre-communist phase has considerable appeal in the region, but what I would like to emphasize is that this shift to authoritarian values and uh, uh, policies was promoted by innovative actors. The actors who became successful because they managed to develop appealing answers to the uh, dilemmas of the 21st century. Now, Hungary is really uh, a front runner, that if you can see that the, the sharpness decline, and it, more importantly, because the Hungarian government explicitly addresses uh, its uh, ideological frame as a response to the discontent of the Western uh, liberal democratic model. It places it bets on a hypothesis according to which Western countries went too far in imposing their anti-traditionalist, multiculturalist, and cosmopolitan attitudes on the non-elites, and in some surrendering sovereignty to supranational uh, institutions. So there is a difference between elites and masses, but according to the government is not so much about economy, as Professor Fukuyama mentioned, it's more about culture. So according to this hypothesis, the people in the West were left behind and ignored. And sooner or later, they will rise against the elite. The refugee crisis is hoped to open the people's eyes and uh, 
Mr. Orban hopes that the prevailing liberal discourse will give a way to a Christian uh, a nationalist discourse. And this is why uh, the recent uh, 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 decline in popularity of Merkel and the success of Freedom Party are interpreted as signs of uh, Europe-wide uh, awakening from a naive liberal illusion. <coughs> now, th these expectations may overestimate the discrepancy between elites and masses. If you look at the Irish uh, referendum about uh, same-sex marriage, if you look about at Spain and Portugal where there are no anti-immigrant parties, if you look at the, how the French radical right has changed towards moral libertarianism, then you see that the Christian nationalist um, alternative is rather losing than gaining popularity. But it's undoubtedly uh, there that the discrepancy between elite and, and masses and um, the current crisis do pose a very serious uh, a test to Western European democracy in this regard, a test that can go both ways. Even if the crises are managed, uh, the European <coughs> Union elite will uh, face uh, uh, increasingly articulated authoritarian response from some of the East European countries. What you could see in the last um, months that even uh, countries like Romania or uh, Slovakia that were very keen on having a Brussels compatible image, even they uh, dare to rebel. Um, and what, what is behind these this, uh, concerns concerning refugees is not only practical concern. There is some kind of search for a new identification uh, frame. Eastern Europe that was seen as a backwater of Europe for a long time now is often seen in more epic light as the last bastion of the white race and Christian culture. Um, it is important to emphasize that uh, this manifestation of authoritarianism that you could quote from Hungarian, Polish, and many other politicians, I don't regard them necessarily as uh, uh, evidence for the breakdown of democracy per se. You can even say that actually they show that politicians are in line with citizens, that democracy is working, liberal democracy faces problems in the region, but populist democracy has even more scope than before because of the waning of the Western influence. At the same time, we see in these uh, charts that, uh, according to the observatories, the democracy uh, scores are declining. That, but this happens not so much because of nationalism and authoritarianism. <coughs> it happens more because of issues of, with media pluralism, partisan use of state power, politicization of the judiciary, lack of transparency, problems with uh, rule of law. Now, of course, these two things are connected, and they are connected in practice by the ascendancy of the authoritarian populist forces into governmental uh, power. Populist has been mentioned uh, by Hans and others earlier. Interesting that while it's a derogatory term, it has a pretty benign understanding in part of political science. So, Canavan, Laclau, Schmitter, Trusted, and others, they often think of populism as antidote to technocratic uh, uh, um, elitist government that could rejuvenate uh, sclerotic politics. Uh, but they assume, very often they assume, that populism is necessarily oppositional and transient. Now, uh, uh, some of the cases uh, that I will talk about uh, show that actually populism can institutionalize it itself, and then the argument about rejuvenation doesn't hold. One recipe that is very often suggested against both low-level democracy and against populism is institutionalized party systems. In institutionalized party system, there is less room for populism, especially not to uh, room to this Latin American or Northern American form of populism, which is erratic and personalistic. And also the example of pre-war democracy, the interwar period in Europe taught us that um, high level of electoral volatility, high level of fragmentation, uh, the fast ascendancy of parties into the government, these are the real dangers. So what we need both lessons teach us is institutionalized party system. This is what will cure all our uh, problems. Accountability will work better. Competition will strengthen democratic norms. And in this case, structured belief system will govern decisions and not personalistic. Leaders. So let me uh, check uh, this, uh, the validity of this claim. Um, uh, the uh, graph shows uh, how uh, countries in the uh, region are situated in terms of uh, quality of democracy and um, 
uh, party system closure, which basically means party system institutionalization. So uh, um, you have high party system closure if parties tend not to change coalition partners, if new parties are rarely allowed to join government or coalition, and if parties either stay in government or leave the government as a team. So the, the last pattern can be contrasted to the case where some of the coalition partners stay and others leave, thereby blurring the boundaries of the political camp. The, root, the origin of this concept also goes back to Peter Mann. So what we would expect normally, that more institutionalized a, a, a country, uh, more democratic it is. But you don't see that on this uh, graph. <coughs> Actually, if you would leave out Ukraine, there would be a very robust, uh, uh, a significant correlation, negative correlation between institutionalization and quality of democracy. And uh, what you can see is there are two uh, groups of countries. So there is uh, the Georgia, Albania, Macedonia, Moldova, Hungary, Montenegro on the borders with Romania and Croatia. They, these countries are relatively institutionalized but underperform in terms of democracy. And then there is another group of countries, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, Slovenia, Slovakia on the borders, that uh, are much less institutionalized but do better in, in uh, terms of democratic uh, quality. Now the first group of countries uh, uh, is really interesting because it shows that the problem is primarily not with uh, under institutionalized party systems, not with uh, kind of convergence of uh, elites and hollowing uh, uh, out and, and uh, cartelization. The problem is with polarization and pluralism. When these two things combine, then you have a serious challenge to democracy. And this pattern you can see not only in this region, but also in countries like Bangladesh, Thailand, or Venezuela. Finally, what I'd like to point out that in many of these cases, uh, the parties that rule, uh, used state power to undermine democratic competition, use uh, state uh, authority against their opponent, they are parties that have been themselves in opposition before. So it is not the case that they have inherited their power position. They grew popular by mobilizing people. And uh, they did that through a semi-open process. Now, um, what this teaches me, or it is the lesson that I, I would like to draw uh, from that, is that we shouldn't reify uh, political systems. We shouldn't think that uh, hybrid systems are actors that produce uh, parties and other political actors. It's parties, political actors, that produce these uh, uh, hybrid systems. And we, political scientists, have spent a little bit too much time blaming elites in general and systems in general, it's time to extend the blame a little bit to citizens that is to ourselves. <laughs> this is um, sort of very much linked to um, the, the uh, presentation we have seen earlier. Um, I'm looking at one dimension here of democratic um, erosion, which is you know, violation of voting practices um, and the erosion of voter uh, autonomy in, in the region. Uh, and you know, we can talk as much as we want about democracy, but if you know, voters' choices are coerced, not free, <laughs> to me and my sort of definition, that's not a democracy. And especially problematic in, in countries such as Romania, where you know, the margin is less than 1% of the vote. <coughs> So if we find evidence that about 15% you know, of the electorate has been subjected to coercion, then clearly this is an explanation of why <laughs> the country election after election brings into power <laughs> sort of right, what, this uh, extremely corrupt uh, uh, political class. Right? So it's really important to understand that. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, uh, to me, I mean, when I started this project, this was very much uh, an empirical question. Is, uh, you know, to what extent, sort of, what are the, you know, on-the-ground practices that we see in the region that uh, will buy sort of voters' autonomy is, uh, is uh, uh, violated. Um, we're looking at, uh, so the presentation today, I'm just recording very uh, general uh, work in progress, so, so results. Uh, we're looking at variation across countries and especially sort of, right, given that there is legislation protecting voting secrecy, but this legislation varies significantly across countries in the region with very strong protection, in fact, in Hungary, and much weaker so in, you know, in Romania and Bulgaria. So to what extent does this kind of you know, protection affect the choices that you know, candidates uh, and brokers 
operating on their behalf, so that we use to influence voters. We're looking at variation across elections, across localities, I'm going to present some results. What I'm more interested in, I'm coming to this from, there's already a vast literature on your plan to this in, in Latin America, but that usually looks at only vote buying, okay, that's one strategy. So what I'm doing here and what we're doing in this project is we're just widening the range of possible strategies that kind of uh, candidates can use at the election, and particularly, I'm interested in coercion and threats and you know, intimidation. That's just something that, uh, you know, even studies on Mexico and Argentina, which sort of have you know two decades of research on plantless and haven't yet unpacked. I'm also looking at variation in the type of brokers. <laughs> Okay, so you know, candidates compete. I mean, I think this links to the question of sort of, you know, what is a party? I mean, what is a party on the ground? It's usually like a mayor in a village, and they have sort of <laughs> some types of brokers that, that mobilize voters on their behalf. So we're trying to understand here empirically who these brokers are and what strategies they use and how they coerce voters. Okay, and then sort of we have very interesting results with respect to individual level variations of who the voters are who are targeted by these strategies. This, this sort of our findings already suggest that this varies significantly across countries. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to get into this, but sort of if there is time in the q and I, um, I can discuss this. Uh, also, sort of we, we have very interesting results on the Roma, so 25% of the voters in all our samples are Roma voters, so I can, I can perhaps talk to that. Um, so this is clearly hard to study using traditional survey techniques. So we're using here these, you know, these methods that sort of have been used, the list experiments again, sort of for you know, s scarcity of time. I cannot go into this. So we're using you know, list experiments that allow us to elicit you know, truthful answers, especially on these sensitive questions where voters are really afraid to talk about this. And there's also desirability bias. We're using multiple list experiments to get at multiple key irregularities. And then we're exploiting differences in economic conditions across countries. So these are some of the uh, studies where I've, I've already conducted. So we started in Bulgaria in 2013, okay. Uh, I'm going to present more here since this is a sort of CEU audience. I'm going to present more of the results on the 2014 election in Hungary, and I can help you put that in perspective. And we've done the study twice in Romania, once in an urban and once in a rural setting. Okay, just to get it to sort of what we're trying to measure. So if you think about the possible strategies by which you know voters can be uh, intimidated. Nice. Okay. So. Um, Right. I'm looking at two types of strategies and a variety of brokers, right? So there's positive inducements. You can offer voters something in exchange for, can you like type there so I don't know if it stops? No, back. So I'm looking at, you know, vote buying, uh, right? That's the sort of standard strategy that has been studied. But sort of what's interesting about the region is that usually kind of the resources that are mobilized politically are resources of the state, policy resources, access, unemployment. Right? That's sort of a unique version of parentalism that is typical in the region. So that would be the brokers would be state employees, you know, um, people working in the uh, state administration. They, and they can do two things. They can offer things, but then of course they can threaten voters to take away, you know, unemployment benefits, social policy benefits, if they make the incorrect choice. We have other brokers, such as private actors, economic actors. In the Hungarian context, we find money lenders as an important brokers that are mobilized kind of politically by candidates in the countryside. And again, they can offer inducements or they can coerce. So what we want to understand is sort of to what extent these strategies, and sort of what's the relative order of magnitude of these strategies and to what extent they vary across countries and across uh, localities. So I'm not going to go over the methodology of the, you know, of the list experiment and how it works. I presume this is familiar, but we have these kind of lists with the, you know, non-sensitive questions, you know, such as uh, a list used here, right? Um, some candidates visited our locality. One of the candidates promised to protect animal rights. None of the candidates visited our locality. And then we add these sensitive items that try to measure these irregularities. Uh, so what are sort of some of the questions that we included in these surveys? Questions about vote buying. Someone offered me money, gifts, or food to vote for a particular party or candidate. Favors. An employee of the state offered me a favor so that I vote for a particular party. OK, pressure by state employee. A state official pressured me to vote for a particular party. In the Hungarian context, we used a, a, somebody threatened to take away the welfare to work benefits if I voted for the wrong candidate. Um, OK. So 
What's the order of magnitude? Okay, so let's just let me just pre present some some general sort of statistics that that allow us sort of. So what's the finding of this? So we were we just want to see first to what extent kind of you know these coercive strategies to what how different is you know Central Europe from you know all the other countries where sort of similar studies have been done, right? So is there sort of some exception? So the the order of magnitude um, is. And in Bulgaria, I mean, the order of magnitude, just to, to, to go to the, to the bottom line, the order of magnitude is comparable to what you know, people have found in Argentina or in, uh, or in, uh, or in Mexico. Okay, so it's about 7 to 8%. Okay, but, but there is variation. Okay, okay, there's strong variation across localities and there's strong variation across strategies. The other interesting thing that I would want to note here, sort of with, just with respect to these aggregate results, is that sort of right, strategies that deploy resources of the state are much more much higher than vote buying. So in fact, by kind of by studying only vote buying, this promises of gifts and money that's just missing out. <laughs> a whole range of other things that might be more influential and they're they're much larger in magnitude. Okay. So you can see this in the Bul Bulgaria results. Well, we can see again um, in the results on Romania. Okay, so so the pressure, meaning the threat to take away welfare benefits is the dominant strategy in the region. This comes across kind of study after study. Okay, this is the Hungarian result. Um, so this is the aggregate result. So the, the, the survey has been fielded in 100 localities uh, immediately after the, the last election, uh, right? So the 2,000 sample respondents. Okay, so sort of right, we find evidence of all these kind of four strategies I mentioned. Okay, in, in these kind of localities. Okay, and sort of right, it is slightly lower. Okay, than, than the other uh, than the other sort of right countries in the region. Okay, but I'm going to show there's, there's uh, other sort of significant differences between Hungary and, uh, and other uh, cases. So speaking to the variation across localities, okay, so we have now these results from the list experiment. Okay, and I want to see sort of to what extent do they vary systematically across localities depending on specific, you know, locality level characteristics such as incumbency, long-term incumbency, has the mayor been in, in office for you know, more than two years, whether the mayor is a fetus mayor, whether there is a divided city hall, meaning sort of right, there is an opposition in the locality, does this really constrain the mayor from you know, deploying you know, these threats on uh, low income voters to, to remove welfare benefits? And also, sort of right, some economic and uh, political characteristics of the locality, you know, unemployment, there's wide variation across Hungary, you know, also go on share, sort of to what extent is this a phenomenon that is. Um, and here's sort of some of the results. I mean, I have a lot, but this is sort of, I think, the main one. And sort of, we have this result on, on you know, on three strategies. And we see sort of right at the, the strongest locality level uh, variable. <laughs> okay, <it> disappear. <laughs> There's somebody undermining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody yeah. 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 So the main result here. Being, um, okay, the main result here being that sort of yes, being a, being a locality with a fetus mayor has you know a higher and statistically significant probability of sort of right of the in the use of welfare. Well, I didn't have this result last time when I was here. It's very striking. Okay. <laughs> Um, and it's very striking that not, uh, I was expecting to see some of the, um, you know, um, I mean, in, in, in the other countries of the region, we see sort of mayor incumbency as being, you know, a predictor. So the longer the mayor in partisanship doesn't play a role. Okay, but in Hungary, sort of incumbency doesn't, doesn't uh, we don't see sort of some incumbency uh, advantage. So, but it is just this, this kind of this, this partisan uh, uh, dimension. We control for a lot of other measures of sort of you know locality level competition. I sort of was expecting that sort of if there is a stronger sort of yobic vote share in the locality, where there's sort of more competition. I and mean, this was a, an, an election sort of fought between the right and the hard right, uh, far right. So I was expecting to find the result, uh, but it's not. Uh, also, with respect to three of the strategies, this is not a Roma phenomenon because this I think was a question that that came up in the. Uh, when I was here, is this sort of something that you just see in, um, you know, in localities with high Roma share, with the exception of the moneylender pressure, where we see strongly sort of that this is higher uh, in locality with a strong, um, okay, how much do I have? Okay, two minutes. Okay, so the bottom line is it is very in systematic ways, and then you can sort of, you know, <laughs> we can uh, we can get at some of this variation. I'm not going, I'm, um, not going to do. Let me just talk a little bit about the, the voters, the individual level results. Okay, so what is interesting, what I found interesting um, in Hungary, and that's, um, let me just go to the result. Um, yeah. Um, 
So again, the topic about sort of, I mean, this, this just leads to the question on sort of, right, the relationship between legislation protecting voting secrecy and the use of these strategies. So in contrast to the other two countries where I have already done this study, I mean, Hungary has a remarkably high protection of voter secrecy. 96% of the respondents in our sample said that the vote is secret, okay? And sort of when this came up, we, we conducted, I mean, sort of there are these anecdotes about, you know, <laughs> sort of right people kind of, you know, taking votes on the cell phones, but it's not like a dominant, I mean, these are just anecdotes, okay? So what is it that, so if this is the case, I mean, who is it that these kind of these brokers and these candidates uh, target? Uh, and uh, what we found really interesting, and this is very much consistent with the, the literature, you know, by Simeon Nichter and so on on turnout buying, is that well, if the vote is secret, okay, you, and since you do not know how the vote, how the voter will kind of cast their ballot, the only thing that you can do is to monitor turnout, okay, and then so, <laughs> the result this implies that you're going to target, okay, that the voter about your whose choice you're certain, so you're going to target the core voter. So we find that sort of right proximity to the parties, sort of right closeness to the parties, the strongest predictor in the use of any of these strategies, including coercion, money lender pressure. Mm -hmm. So and so what they do is they really tar, so we call this the core vo voters curse, because it is sort of right control, and there's no Roma effect. We found this very, very surprising. They don't do this to Roma voters. They, they target their loyal supporters, and this is a strategy by which they, under conditions of, of uh, you know, ballot secrecy, they, they try to, uh, in a way, to maximize their, uh, their turnout. So the bottom line is that sort of, I mean, if I if I look at kind of you know these variety of sort of clientelistic practices in the region, a lot of the variation in the sort of the strategies and in the type of voters that are being threatened are determined by these sort of broader institutional variables which have to do with sort of the protection of, of voter secrecy and so on. So I'll, I'll stop uh, here maybe because it's uh, and I can um, yeah I can <coughs> over time. It's not Okay. Uh, so now we have Vanessa. All right. So um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about why the United States is increasingly unable to reliably achieve basic governmental functions at the federal level. And I became interested in this question a few years ago um, because the government, the federal government shut down for a little while uh, and that was a relatively unusual phenomenon. In particular, it was unusual in the extent to which it affected government functions. There have been other times when Congress could not agree on a budget, but this had much larger economic effects. And of course, uh, as I've been working on it, it became current again uh, because the, we only narrowly averted another budget shutdown just a few days ago, and there is another crisis looming on the horizon at the end of the year. Um, and so a little bit of background about why this question interested me. My previous research had been on the origins and impact of the Tea Party in the United States, the conservative movement that so successfully revitalized the Republican Party and is still affecting, in fact, uh, in some extent, leading the Republican Party today. Uh, so before I get to a little bit about what I call austerity by gridlock, that is to say uh, the imposition of major sort of budget cuts via the failure of basic government institutions, um, I want to talk a little bit about what the Tea Party was and what I think it is today. Uh, the most important thing to realize about the Tea Party is that it is not a single unitary uh, organization. It is, in fact, based in my in the book. Uh, I talk about it in terms of three parts. First of all, that there was a grassroots mobilization, primarily older white conservatives against the Obama administration. You will remember that Obama comes into power at a time of economic crisis uh, when it seemed very likely that major progressive policies might be passed, including. Uh, what remains for us a very progressive policy, any kind of healthcare reform whatsoever. Um, so Obama comes to power and there is a backlash among conservatives uh, who are uh, concerned both about the progressive policies might institute the redistribution that might occur under his administration, but more generally about the person of Barack Obama, uh, who is for conservatives a representation of a younger America, a more diverse America, and particularly an immigrant America. Um, so there's this it basically immediate within the first weeks of his administration backlash to uh, the Obama administration. That backlash, which was localized and was actually arguing about a number of different things, is consolidated uh, to a large degree by the second component of the Tea Party, the conservative media, which is a very powerful institution 
uh, in my country that created coherence to those grassroots concerns and focused them particularly on the budget. As opposed to some of their more natural concerns, immigration, which are now uh, more at the forefront of uh, our political debates. The final component of the Tea Party that is worth thinking about is the elite Tea Party. Uh, this includes elect officials who've come to office in the last few years, but it also includes some um, advocacy organizations that had previously been a little bit on the periphery of the Republican Party. Now, well-funded, but not really central uh, to, for instance, the Bush administration's uh, campaign efforts. Uh, these elite groups recognized the opportunity that this grassroots anger about Obama provided and uh, did their best to harness that, and I think did so very successfully. So groups like Americans for Prosperity, Freedom Works, and some other groups that had previously been on the fringe of American politics really moved to the center, and I think you can see that uh, today in the, uh, the potential candidates for the Republican um, Republican nomination, though all of those all of those candidates are seeking the support of some of these groups that really weren't at the forefront of Republican politics a few years ago. All right, so that's the Tea Party. It's got grassroots elements, it's got a media apparatus, and it's got an increasingly powerful uh, elite component that both funds campaign campaigns and has uh, elected offices across the country. The result has been a Republican Party that has shifted to the right. Now, the Republican Party has been shifting to the right, uh, as I'm sure you know, for uh, decades now, and this was merely sort of the latest iteration of that. Nonetheless, I think it has been uh, significant in terms of the policy achievements of the sort of Tea Party brand of republicanism, not the positive policy achievements in the sense of creating policy, but the policy achievements in terms of blocking policy. Now, the Affordable Care Act, the health care reform law, um, that they sought to prevent, they did not succeed in preventing. But what they have done instead is prevent a much more basic functioning of government, um, a much more basic um, uh, use, a, a much more basic, let's say, the fundamental part of um, budgeting procedures. That is to say, um, that what has happened in, since 2010 uh, is a series of self-imposed crises where boring, uninteresting, non-newsworthy procedural um, processes within the federal government have become a series of self-inflicted wounds uh, that grind the government to a halt. And what that has done is move the United States from what had originally been a policy of stimulus, the Obama administration comes in and actually spends a tremendous amount of money uh, to try and get the economy going again, uh, has moved from that, that moment of stimulus to uh, what is uh, a really ill conceived form of austerity in which things literally just stop, right? Uh, Non-essential government function comes to a halt. So austerity by gridlock is what we've seen. And I thought um, this morning a really interesting point was raised, it actually also came up yesterday evening, about whether we're talking about failure of governance or we're talking about failure of democracy, right? And so this is, in some sense, a failure of governance in that the government is not doing the most obvious function it is supposed to do, which is pass a budget. Uh, but it is also, in some sense, uh, well, when it comes to being a failure of democracy, I think it's more paradoxical, right? So is the Tea Party phenomenon a democratic phenomenon? To some extent, the answer is yes, right? Because members of the Tea Party, and I, the book is based on a wide array of data, but it includes uh, me and my co-author traveling across the country and interviewing Tea Partiers at their local meetings and sort of seeing how they interact with local government. Uh, and so at that level, their political engagement is terribly impressive. Uh, not only do local activists you know, run very well organized meetings that have great turnout every week and then they you know, will go to the local Republican committee, vote out everyone and take all of those seats for themselves, they really follow the procedures that are parliamentary procedures, they run for local office. Um, they're very engaged in local issues, they're tremendously well informed about you know, what their congressman is doing on the issues they care about. So on that, on that dimension, uh, the Tea Party is tremendously democratic, and uh, the kind of political participation that I think a lot of democratic activists would like to see. Um, but by some <coughs> other measures, it is extremely undemocratic, and the most obvious example of that is the engagement of Tea Party activists in voter suppression, right? And we talked about this already a little this morning, uh, that there have been a series of new laws passed primarily in Republican states um, that, are intended, that are intended to require voters to have identification, what effect of that, I mean, which would be fine if everyone had identification and it didn't suppress people from turning out at the polls, but in the United States it does, particularly young people and particularly minorities. Um, and Tea Party activists have been very involved in getting those laws passed. So in that sense, it is an anti-democratic um, movement. Uh, and it is also not undemocratic in another more fundamental way, which is that 
activists in the Tea Party and many of the elected officials associated with the Tea Party do not see compromise as part of the process. Right? And so you can't actually have a democracy functioning with opposing views and a complete unwillingness to compromise and get anything done. Um, and so the problem with having um, one, a, even a minority uh, population within the government completely unwilling to compromise is that with American institutions, uh, even a minority can bring government to a halt, right? And so that's what we've been seeing, the sort of intersection of this uh, sort of radical right movement with uh, a very elderly set of American institutions that were designed in a very different time, mostly, uh, have, has allowed for um, a real limitation in terms of the amount that policy can get passed at all. And I think in many ways that's quite uh, dangerous. So to sort of summarize, I think what we've what we've seen over the past few years is that uh, activists in the Tea Party are ideologically committed to the idea that government can't work. Uh, and because of the American institutions, they are able to ensure that it doesn't. And I think that that is uh, a tremendously troubling phenomenon. And so uh, I wanted to end um, on a more positive note. Uh, I wanted to be able to say, where can we go from here, given these uh, strong limitations on what can be achieved? Uh, in at least at the federal level. And so I guess the one uh, place where I would suggest that there is some room for optimism is uh, to highlight another note that someone raised earlier today, which is that the Tea Party demographic or <coughs> the Donald Trump supporters, or however you want to think about it, sort of the far-right, strongly anti-immigration, very mobilized conservative base is a small percentage of the American <coughs> electorate. And that part of the American electorate is also getting smaller. So while um, it is certainly the case that uh, American institutions privilege minorities uh, in terms of delay and the uh, prevention of policy uh, response, it can't do that indefinitely, right? There is a minimum size that one must have in order to hold uh, um, enough seats to uh, block progress, or not anything at all, really. Um, and I, so I think that the extent to which there is a sort of tyranny of the minority uh, that is that has brought the United States government mostly to a halt in the last few years. Um, that tyranny minority is only up to a point. Now, I think the important question in the United States going forward is is what uh, Professor personally works on, uh, which is creating a system in which uh, the uh, representatives more accurately represent their electorates, and there's a little bit less of the um, sort of extreme. Uh, uh, polarization within districts and, and across, and I guess, across districts uh, that has um, allowed such extreme candidates to come to power and be uh, re-electable on a regular basis. Um, so I guess I would just I would just conclude by saying uh, that the Tea Party, uh, which I began studying, which I thought was a little bit of uh, a flash in the pan, has uh, fundamentally changed. I think to some extent the dynamics of American politics in that they have brought to power a different set of conservatives, a set of conservatives who are more fundamentally less committed to, the, to agreeing even on facts, much less on, on policy positions. Um, and, uh, and it is an extremely well-funded uh, minority. Um, and so I guess I would say just in conclusion that uh, in the very long term, I don't think this is going to be the um, stumbling block for American politics. But that may not matter if it remains a stumbling block for American politics for the next, uh, for the foreseeable next few years. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. Uh, so uh, let me just make a few brief comments uh, of my own, and then we'll open it up in about a half hour for uh, back and forth. Um, there's been a growing discomfort among many political scientists in the United States for a while now uh, that I think has matured partly into this conference with the, you know, wall of separation between the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, that is, um, we have a feeble uh, in most political science departments in the United States called American politics, and then we have comparative politics. And um, I think increasingly there is a feeling that, you know, the United States is certainly distinctive, 
it is probably unique in some respects. I, I think some of Frank's writing about the extent of our um, vitocracy is the word he <laughs> favors, and it certainly feels like that on many days, um, uh, makes it distinctive, but it is not unique. And there are many features that I think beg for comparison with other democracies. If we're going to compare the United States with other democracies, probably makes sense to start with European democracies, maybe West European democracies more than Central and East Euro European democracies because they're older and more <laughs> developed, but European democracies in general and, quote, advanced in industrial democracies. So I'll just say I think this is it, it's not a trend unique to our program at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. I think it's where political science as a field uh, belatedly is heading. Uh, but this conference is one effort to try and break down what increasingly seems to be an artificial uh, boundary. Now, if we talk about democratic backsliding, and what we really mean uh, is backsliding toward the possibility of non-democracy, uh, it may seem odd to have the United States in this panel, uh, frankly. Uh, even I, who um, you know, am probably uh, about as negative about the Tea Party as a uh, conventional political scientist in the United States would be, um, don't think they're anti-democratic or the harbinger you know, of a fascist dictatorship in the United <coughs> States or something like that. Um, but I do think that um, there are points that emerge uh, that I just want to uh, you know, note a little more sharply uh, in which we can, um, we can be concerned. Uh, I want to be clear in saying um, that uh, I don't think in our worst nightmare in the near term, uh, whatever degree of extremism, polarization, and deadlock and dysfunction, the Tea Party in the United States interacting with whatever degree of drift to the left, and I do think increasingly we are seeing that in the Democratic Party, I don't see a scenario in which that will lead in the next 10 to 20 years to the United States ceasing to be a democracy, okay? I think we can see a scenario uh, in which uh, certain member states of the, of the European Union could continue, unnamed at this point, uh, but known in this room, uh, could continue a drift of illiberalism to the point where one would have to question, even in the most basic Schumpeterian sense of democracy, which is the ability of people to choose their leaders and replace their leaders in fully free and fair elections, whether a line of dissent would be crossed into something that could no longer be called, even in the say, to say that, uh, in Hungary and in other parts of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and we see with certain actors in the United States, but I think very clearly um, with the Tea Party and with some of the spectacle we're witnessing uh, in uh, the Republican Party debate so far, uh, to use your language, uh, Jolt, uh, defection from liberal values, from the norms of open society. So illiberal populism, uh, I would assert, I don't think it's a very uh, controversial statement, is on the rise um, both in the United States uh, and in Europe in different ways to different degrees. Uh, and certainly the specter being mobilized uh, in different ways because they have very different drivers, origins, degrees, and so on, but the specter of immigration from other parts of the world is, uh, uh, is a driving element of this, at least one. But the second, and I think more interesting one, is increasing political polarization. <clears throat> so now I'd like to read uh, the, these couple of sentences from your paper, uh, Scholl, um, which I think have some interesting applications to the United States. So he's talking, if you remember that slide he put, put up, when there's two groups of 
of countries uh, in, in the kind of post-communist space, post-communist European space. The countries that have lower democratic quality, so they're further to the left uh, on the a horizontal axis, but higher party system institutionalization, so they're higher up, so they're in the upper left uh, uh, quadrant. Countries like Georgia, Macedonia, Mol Moldova, Hungary, and then the countries that have somewhat less party system institutionalization, but dramatically higher um, uh, democratic quality, like the Baltic states and the Czech Republic and Poland. So the existence of the first group of countries in the upper left quadrant shows, he says, that the problem for liberal democracy and the consolidation of democracy in general is connected to the high degree of polarization. In these countries, in the upper left quadrant, parties have hostile relations with each other. They cannot agree on a number of fundamental questions, sound familiar, Vanessa, concerning the boundaries and character of the political community. Um, and, and they use the state apparatus against their opponents. Now, have we crossed that line in the United States? Um, well, I would argue that uh, voter suppression uh, is the use of the state apparatus against their opponents. And um, I don't think enough, I mean, it's not like we don't know what's going on in the United States, but I think the extent of voter suppression uh, is a deeply illiberal and frankly undemocratic phenomenon in the United States that needs to be confronted more uh, frontally, <laughs> to repeat myself, both politically and judicially. Uh, than it has been so far. I think it's obvious what's going on uh, and the motives behind it are um, barely concealed. I just wanted to make uh, two more points uh, to kind of broaden the arc of comparison, which we won't be doing probably very often in this conference. Mainly what I study are democracies outside North America and the United States. Uh, and I'd say uh, two points in conclusion. One is that this combination, which is the combination, uh, Schult, that you uh, conclude with, populism and polarization combined, uh, is a frequent, um, uh, prominent factor, uh, and I would even say a causal factor, but then you have to back up and ask, what's causing that? But it's, it's a frequent, prominent factor in the decay and failure of democracy uh, in Latin America, Asia, and elsewhere. And it is kind of the formula that has dragged down Venezuela into a non-democracy. It is the formula that has, uh, you know, sucked down uh, democracy into military rule all over again in Thailand. And you just look around, uh, you mentioned Bangladesh as well, and you can mention other cases uh, of democratic failure in the world. So I think that's an extremely important point to note. Final point is that uh, almost everywhere where we find uh, democratic decline over the last 10 years, and I think it's been uh, a noteworthy phenomenon, uh, I do believe we're in a democratic uh, recession. I think you can show statistically that the leading indicator is declining the rule of law. Uh, and I'll just say, maybe I'll be able to say it in more detail tomorrow. If you break apart the Freedom House indicators of political rights and civil liberties from those two components into, I think, a better and more coherent uh, scaling of political rights, civil liberties, and the rule of law, and then track what's been happening over the last eight years in the post-communist states and in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, what you see is in each of those regions and most of the others, two things. Number one, the indicator standardized on a measure of zero to 100 that um, performs the worst is transparency and the rule of law. And the one that declines the most over these last eight years is transparency and the rule of law. And so that's the kind of canary in the coal mine. Okay, with that, we now go to whatever questions you have for our panelists that might have been provoked by uh, their presentations. Daniel Stitt.
Thanks for a great panel. Um, let me offer uh, an observation. Observation masquerading as a question, but I think you can all speak to it. Which is, you know, do we need, in effect, to buck up uh, liberal political science when it comes to identifying and describing and critiquing uh, forms of partisanship that, while not anti-system in the traditional sense, are ultimately corrosive of the systems? And I, I just was in listening to each of you describe these forms of partisanship, I was uh, just thinking about, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, if we were to have a meeting like this about, you know, democracy and its discontents and had a party system session, there would have been a lot of talk about party systems and how to, uh, you know, uh, isolate and marginalize fascist and communist parties. Um, uh, and, but, but those are kind of like quite crude uh, categories, and it struck me that each of you are describing something that's much more in a gray area, parties that are working within the system, in some ways speaking to its values, but are denying it really uh, the values or the, the modes of compromise that would be needed. And so maybe there is some conceptual apparatus that you're working with, but it just strikes me that it seems like there's a little bit of a vacuum there in, in political science when it comes to describing this. Maybe not. Interesting question. And of course, there are truly what Juan Lentz would call blatantly disloyal anti-system parties out there, but they're not what we've been talking about here, I don't think. Okay, I'm going to collect a few with your permission, and then I'll give you each plenty of time to respond. Who's next? Andres? Hi, I'm Julia McCarthy. Oh. Where are, someone has a mic? Oh, I didn't see yeah. it. Please, go ahead. So, I'm Julia Alcano from Center for Fair Political Analysis in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And actually, it can be a general question for whoever wants to answer it. Um, thinking of this whole overarching question of whether democracy is in crisis and whether democracies are backsliding all over the world, but I'm very grateful for both the US perspective and the regional perspective appearing in this panel. I'm really thinking whether is there a one-size-fits-all, I don't know, um, version of democracy for the, all of the world. What we see after the change of regime is that, for example, the Central Eastern European countries all applied or took over a Western uh, European or rather Western version of liberal democracy. And we are institutionalized and we have all these institutions, yet it's not the same and it's not the same culture or political tradition. So I'm thinking, is there some way of using these um, definitions of what we see as a good governance or good democracy and applying it all over the world? Thank you. And you mean more of an emphasis on an effective state than on liberal democracy? What exactly do you mean? I mean, well, we asked whether it's a failure of governance or, or a failure of democracy. I think, do we see difficulties in applying a system as a failure of democracy in general? Or do we see it really as a failure of governance or a failure of adapting to something we see as good or a, a, something that should be followed? Okay. Who's next? There's a question down here uh, and then up there. Okay. If I may, I would like to speak a little bit towards the competition among the parties. And, you know, coming from the perspective here in Central and Eastern Europe, where often the voters are offered competition. So they are offered the different choices of a plurality of political parties that unfortunately often don't offer alternative policies. And they don't really differ in terms of interest that they genuinely represent. So we have oligarchs who basically invest into numerous political parties as an investor would do, creating a well-diversified portfolio where effectively it doesn't really matter whom you vote for because at the end of the day, the, the true interest of the number of oligarchs is always taken into account. There might be small differences in, in more of a cultural things or there might be differences, <coughs> not, but not really in substance. So the voter then is left with a false choice. You have pluralism, you might have a competition, but your choice is basically futile and irrelevant. 
And which set of countries do you particularly have in mind in that regard? <laughs> Slovakia, Czech Republic, Bulgaria, just to name a few. But you would see elements of this in, in a number of countries. And that also, it's, it's partly related also to the development of media, but I don't really want to shift the discussion to that, where you basically see uh, rich individuals buying the media just in case. <laughs> Okay. I'm Peter Moon, and I'm a sad founder of Fides. And my question is about that when popul uh, popularization and populism, the combination of the two, produces uh, the crisis, then would you agree that uh, populism, which often extends to forms of so called hate speech against the other side, would you agree that at least several countries or many countries it comes from the right wing of the politics which often does not have a clear line between <coughs> itself and the extreme right? And if so, would you agree that part of the left or liberal side of the spectrum in allowing it happen may be letting the right wing to monopolize to some extent the national traditions and what it means to be American, what it means to be Hungarian, and so on and so forth. So to what extent this same hostility has a, and populism has a historic element uh, and, and depends on, on lack of, of common understanding of or common history, and on the other hand, the distortion of what should be a common understanding of our history and exclusion of some people from the common history based on the distorted understanding. Thank you. Good. Well, that's certainly a question we can discuss uh, in the context of all of these countries, Carson. Yeah. So my Carsten Schneider from CEU Political Science, and mine is a question that goes to everyone on the panel and probably to everyone in the room. Uh, I don't think we have time for it. <laughs> it's a very short question, not, we have no time to answer, but at least to ask the question, maybe. I, mean, I fully agree with probably all in the room that there is some sort of crisis, but at the same time, I agree with Guillermo O'Donnell, who says that's the essence of democracy. It's always in crisis. It has been in crisis even in times which we now refer back to as the golden age of democracy. So, so I see some sort of uh, paradox here. Because it's an idea, uh, we will always um, feel that we come short of what we actually want. That doesn't help anything, but it probably uh, takes a little bit out of uh, steam of the general uh, somehow feeling of us going down the drain, but probably that has been a constant feeling at any given, and the, the solution is usually how we answer to the crisis, but it will uh, result in the next crisis. So, it wasn't even a question, sorry. <laughs> Maybe, if not constant, at least continual, that is, it, it, with every generation, something comes up that generates it. Uh, have we exhausted all the questions? Or anyone else? I, I just have a follow-up to what Carsten said. <laughs> Very quick. Uh, ben Ans for Oxford. Um, I, I, I agree with Carsten's point, because it's very easy, just like we're always in a new economy, right? This, this time it's different. So it, it's always it's it's always very attractive to think that the world we're in now is, is the one in which the big question has suddenly emerged. Um, I think one can make it, I, I don't want to contradict what Larry's saying about many of the, uh, the rigidities emerging further in, in existing hybrid regimes. I think that's true. But I think the Western countries have done remarkably well, given the economic context of the last eight years, because the only previous comparable point in terms of economic downturns is the 1930s, uh, or even the late 19th century. Uh, so I, I think you know, we need to think about what the counterfactual is, right? Um, this is a pretty good outcome, given how bad things were, and one might have expected uh, radical right parties uh, to do far better than they have, radical left parties to do far better than they have, either in terms of electoral support or in accomplishing their goals once they actually make it into government. I would phrase it slightly differently, because the really deeply established and advanced industrial democracies <coughs> Whether Britain, the United States, France would have if Germany hadn't invaded, 
uh, you know, they weren't consumed by the economic depression, which was much worse than what we have experienced, awful though it was. What I think is more impressive is that, you know, if we're in a democratic recession, it hasn't been what Huntington would have called the third reverse wave of democratization. And so if you, if you had known that this kind of economic global downturn was coming, uh, you might have expected that there had been a much more uh, significant set of democratic reversals. Also, I think I've shown in a publication, but I'll leave others to evaluate, at least I've argued that um, the, uh, the reason for the democratic failures we have seen is actually not primarily economic. I think it has more to do with party <laughs> polarization, illiberalism driven by other things, but anyway, we can debate that at the break. Okay, I think we should give our panelists time to reply. Why don't we go in reverse order? And so, Vanessa, why don't you start? Sure. So I think that, um, just as I respond uh, generally to some of the themes that uh, the questioners raised, um, I just want to underline the extent to which uh, the, the Tea Party is sort of a paradox, right? And particularly in the extent to which their local engagement is what democracy is expected to look like in the United States. Um, that people actually show up to local meetings. This is not a Halloween, it is the opposite of that. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's especially important in the United States, and I realize I should have uh, emphasized this, that so much of governing happens locally. That engagement at the local level is really meaningful. Uh, and I think that that's something that's uh, worthy of attention, and also the extent to which people in the Tea Party, and this I saw across the country, uh, value their status as citizens, value their status as taxpayers, uh, as participants in the in the country, um, and, and have a real sense of urgency about their role as citizens, about their participation. Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, you know, generally you know something we should buck up about. Um, but the the problem and the sort of limitation of it is the extent to which they the community to whom they feel responsible, the range of people they see as citizens like themselves is, is smaller than the range of citizens that actually are part of the country and actually are participating. Uh, and so I think that the, the tendency to perceive those who disagree with you as bad actors is uh, uh, an unfortunate one uh, in a democratic context. Um, the other thing I'll say, uh, just to follow up on, on what you were saying is, uh, the U.S. institutions uh, are, you know, sclerotic, shall we say, um, and, but the other thing is they're very old, which maybe is good news. They've pulled through time and again through major crises, and I mean, admittedly, on, on some measures, the level of polarization in the country is similar to uh, the kind of polarization we saw right around our civil war, so uh, maybe it's not so great, but nonetheless, I think that there's, uh, there is some, there's some room to imagine that if, uh, if all the other crises uh, have been dealt with within this particular set of institutions, uh, these should uh, be crises we can handle as well. 